in a second, but I would like you to introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Phyllis Rackin. I had you as my student many years ago. Yes. Uh, I taught at Penn uh, ever since 1962. Uh, I've been teaching Shakespeare most of that time. I'm officially retired, but I'm still teaching Shakespeare. And I write books and articles about Shakespeare. And uh, oh, can I name my books so that people Please will name buy your them? books. Yes. 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 Do you get you get a good percentage on that? No, I get a very poor percentage, which means I need to sell a lot of them. Um, my most recent book is uh, Oxford University Press, and it's called Shakespeare and Women, and it's very readable, and it's a short paperback, easily available on Amazon.com. Uh, the one before that was called Engendering a Nation, a Feminist Account of Shakespeare's Histories, which I uh, co-authored with Jean Howard, who's a professor at Columbia University, uh, and that was uh, published by Routledge in England, but it too can be had on Amazon. And the one before that was called Stages of History, Shakespeare's English Chronicles, which was also on the History Blaze. And it, it was published by Cornell. It too can be had on Amazon. And my first book, written many years ago, was called Shakespeare's Tragedies, and I imagine it's out of print. But it can be found in the library. In the library, exactly. That's good. And That's good. I would, I, I, I need everything. <laughs> That's right. The, the Penn Retirement Fund is not. Oh, no, it's, it's good. I'm just greedy. Um, so where do we begin? You don't have to talk to the camera. You can talk to me. Okay, uh, I was except unless you're pitching your books, then you can go right, right into camera. <laughs> I loved your film. I, I um, as you know, I, I want to show it to my students next year. Um, it just I found it very moving. Uh, your Portia was wonderful, and you used her so well. And your focus on Portia, I think, was exactly right. I've, I've never seen a production that had such a strong portion. That that's that's so what important. I took away from your class all those years ago, which we won't mention the number of years, was I just remember that. I held on to that, and then when I was going to look at the text, it was very clear to me that that was so important in shaping, shaping the production. Well, you know, I looked something up in, pre in preparation for our talk today, uh, got numbers. I looked up the numbers as well. In the did RSC it? version, or did you look them up somewhere else? I looked up in uh, Spivak's Concordance to Shakespeare how many, what percentage of the words in the script. Yeah, what do you get? What'd you get on that? What'd I you, got. Uh, it's over 20. Antonio speaks 6.837 percent. <laughs> yes. Bassanio 12.379 percent. Shylock 13.746 percent. And Portia 22.21 yeah, percent. Yeah. What is it? Almost three times as many as uh, Antonio. Oh, more than three times as many as Antonio. Almost twice, and twice as, as much as Bassanio and Shylock. Exactly, right? and um, so you, you by doing an uncut version, you got that got it in, and also uh, the way you focused in on Portia's face so often, like in the scene where the uh, the dreadful suitors are choosing, okay. and you see her anguish. It's I don't know if you could communicate that on the stage as well as you do. I, I think, yeah, I, I knew certainly the way I was staging it with Morocco in the background and Portia on um, uh, downstage yeah. would be a way to communicate the fact that this is, this is a story, this is a scene about her, and let Morocco be back there doing his things. But, but and this is one thing you learn about directing, what is she going through emotionally? What is, what is she truly feeling if this man is going to choose the right casket. She's going to have to get married and have sex with him within hours. This man is a buffoon. I mean. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it came across so, so beautifully, so powerfully. I just love that. Yeah. I, I've never seen the casket scenes done so well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, again, it was about a lot of productions, I think, mistakenly focus on the caskets, like all this business about the, bas the caskets, and it's really about what will happen to her yeah. and, and her crisis. Um, what helped you focus on Portia sort of as you came to discover the play and learn about the play? Well, partly because uh, one of the puzzles in the play is how does that play fit together? It's got really three distinct plots. It's got the Venice plot about the bond for the pound of flesh. It's got the Belmont plot about ch uh, choosing the right casket to get to marry Portia. And it's got the ring plot. And I thought, um, 
there's only one character who's central to all three plots, and that's Portia. Uh, Sherlock has never appears in Belmont, so he's got nothing to do with the casket plot or the ring plot. And the, uh, nobody else is central in all three plots the way she is. So even before I looked up these numbers and realized how many more lines she had, structurally she's also central. I remember that from your class as well, that a lot of people sort of throw away the fifth act. They just say, oh, the climax is in the trial scene. And it's really not. It's the turning point as we get into what I would consider Act Three. But the the climax, what is important, is Portia. She's been pursuing Bassanio since the very beginning, since you know Act One, Scene Two, when she's talking to Nerissa about all these other suitors that she's just so not interested in that she tries, sort of, depending on how the actress plays it, but she's certainly not wanting to deal with that, but then Nerissa brings up Bassanio, and she's like, yes, that's the man for me, and then you get the whole, the whole story is headed to that moment, like, can she, can she be with this guy? I love that line, too, she says, yes, yes, it was Bassanio, uh, as I think, so was he called, she tries to kind of cover up, I think, she, right. she immediately knows who Nerissa's talking about, but right. she doesn't want to let on. And there's that, that interesting thing that Shakespeare always does with the class differences, it's very clear that Portia's upper class, and she's aristocracy, she has to behave a certain way, and then she's allowed to have, Shakespeare uses Nerissa to give voice to some of those other, like, yeah, this is the guy I want to be with. Yeah, yeah. It, so. it, it, she's, she's, she's wonderful. She's just wonderful. I uh, Now, one thing I um, wanted to ask you about, because there's a character who's uh, very problematic to me, and I didn't understand what you were doing with her, and I also uh, have um, there, there's a debate going on about Jessica right now yeah. uh, in the I love scholarship. Jessica. Yeah. And, um, you know, some, some uh, writers, and I think more of them now, say that she is never really fully assimilated into the Christian society. Oh, not at all. And, no. Yeah, and I got the feeling that's what you were doing with her, uh, in that her clothes were a little dowdy, she was a little frumpy, She's, right. she always seems a bit out of place. Uh, and I've, I've seen uh, some stage productions that go even further in making her an outsider. I'm not convinced that that's right. But Why is that? Is that? Um, well, I think that the issue of conversion is very important to us now. Uh, I think in the play, uh, it's more about money. Uh, the only time the word conversion or convert is actually used in the entire play is in Act Three in the scene where Bassanio chooses the right casket, and Portia says, "Myself and what is mine are now converted." All uh, right, I hadn't thought about that word in that way before. So yeah. it's and it's used to mean the conversion of money, from, and I think that in a way, uh, the play is about getting money into the right hands, and getting Shylock's money into Lorenzo's hands is. Uh, a, a desired and desirable thing, and I, and I'm not sure having an unassimilated, unhappy Jessica uh, conduces to. Well, that I have a couple project. of thoughts on that. Um, the first is when I looked at the text, I assumed that the Lorenzo Jessica subplot was about these lovers who love each other and they come together and all of that. That was my memory of the play. That's because that's the way I saw it. Okay. And then I cast the actors. Everything's fine. And I had seen, I especially loved the Jessica that I was able to get. She's very sensitive. And there's another instance that I think the film does her more justice than the stage because she has so few lines of dialogue and I think this actress was able to bring a lot of beauty and subtle, subtlety to the role. But what, what we discovered in rehearsal fairly quickly was here is a relationship that is going apart. It is not a relationship. It's a relationship, I think, very, it does a lot of themes that are similar in most of Shakespeare's plays, is that these lovers come together and they love each other and it's great and then they start, the fantasy starts to wear off. I think that's what Shakespeare's about is, that hot rush of first love. And then by the end of the play, where Jessica and Lorenzo are just totally miscommunicating, 
And another thing we found is there's a love triangle there. Lancelot, the clown, loves Jessica. And in fact, they understand each other. Yeah. And they truly do love each other, not in a way that she could ever, you know, think of. Him as an erotic object. Yeah. Right. But no, the, but it's like a brother, the way you love a brother. Exactly. And I think she realizes in a way that that kind of communication she can have with him. Not only that, Lancelot's a lot smarter than Lorenzo. He's kind of adult, you know. Well, I thought that sparring in Act Five, you know, about um, the famous unfaithful lovers. Yes. I. Uh, you know, people who see the play as you do, and, and I think they're in the majority, so you're probably right, and I'm, you know, I'm just being stubborn, but um, feel that they're, the fact that these are all lo loves that end unhappily, that, like yes. the Jason and Medea story, right. uh, says that there's trouble between Jessica and Lorenzo. You see, I, I see that kind of amorous sparring more like uh, what goes on between Beatrice and Benedict, what goes on right. between... Uh, Portia and Bassanio, certainly. But that Beatrice and Benedict, that sparring happens early. Yeah. And by the end of, by you, the time you get to the Good end point. of Much Ado About Nothing, I mean, she's asking him to murder his best friend. Yeah. And yeah. so that's, again, I think sort of the fantasy it's relationship sort of trajectory. Moving, yeah. moving into this. Right. I mean, I just saw All's Well That Ends Well a couple of years ago. I was like, oh my God. You know, she's pursued this guy, he's treated her like dirt, and then. Yeah. She's got him. Now what? You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I do. Well, she, I guess she's happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think, I think, I mean, I always see, especially the end of Merchant of Venice, is, again, they've, from the beginning, all they've done is batted their eyelashes at each other. Uh -huh. Bassanio says, I've seen, I received, well, you probably, you know the text as well as I do. Bare speechless messages. Bare speechless <laughs> messages, right? Yeah. You know, they looked at each other and go, you know, batting their eyelashes at each other. And by the end, he's given away his wedding ring. And I said, uh, you know, not unfortunately, but the actors I was, I was working with, they're 19, 20 years old, which is perfect for the play. Yeah. But at the same time, this is my wedding ring. And you have a wedding ring? Right. Would you ever... This is always on my hand, always. So to give that away is such a betrayal. Well, it's interesting. The, wet, the, wet, the way the wedding ring changes depending on whether it's in Belmont or in Venice. And it's the same as Bassanio. When Bassanio's in Venice, he sounds like a, a vulgar fortune hunter. The first thing he says about right. Porsche is in Belmont is the lady richly left. And, and then that, he gets I think up. that leads a lot of people on the wrong path, though. I think he's trying to get Antonio to understand it in his terms. But anyway, go ahead. But and when he's um, when he's in Belmont, the wedding ring is just what you think your wedding ring is, and I think my wedding ring is. It's a right. pledge of love. It's a gift. When he's in Venice, the young lawyer demands it as a fee for service. So the thing that is a gift is transformed into a commodity, and it's transformed into payment. Right. And then when he when he gets back to Belmont and Portia gets it back from him, but has it back and finally gives it to him again, she transforms it back into a gift. So it's the different this the ring has a different status depending on which world it's in, I think. But I think always it represents the sexual bond, the sexual commitment of the partner. When you give someone a ring, you say, I'm going to be monogamous with you. And I think it's very, very telling that Bassanio says, I won't give you my ring, sir. And then who speaks up and tells him to give the ring Antonio, away? Antonio, of course. Antonio, of yeah, course, yeah. yeah. So it's Antonio that's getting in the way of this sexual union. Yeah, yeah. Um, for whatever reason, which we can go into in a minute. Uh, so even in Venice, I think that, although you could say it's payment, it still represents his bond, his commitment to Portia and his sexual fidelity to Portia. It does as long as he keeps it on his finger. Right, which he doesn't. But yeah, once he takes it off his finger, it becomes a commodity, I think. Right. And um, should we delve into Antonio territory? Sure, <laughs> sure. Because that's, that, that's been going on forever. That's, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a, since I think around 1920, was it E.K. Chambers or somebody? But certainly in the last 25 years, it's been, uh, that, that relationship between Antonio and Bassanio is coming for a lot of attention. Right. I'd be curious to hear what your take, I mean, I know what my take is on it, which I think is different than a lot of 
what I've read before, I yeah. hope, but what, what is your take on it? Well, you know, again, I, I, I probably could sound old fashioned. Um, that open, one place that critics who feel that the, um, Antonio's passion for Bassanio is a central engine of the play, uh, focus on is the opening dialogue where Antonio is so melancholy mm -hmm. and he, he uh, the whole, it's a very strange opening for the play because it goes on for, I don't know, about 120 lines or so, uh, all about um, Antonio's mel. I don't know why I'm so melancholy. Right. Well, maybe it says, no, not that. Oh, maybe it says, no, not that. And they just go on and on and on about the melancholy and they never, ever come to a definitive answer, uh, he just says, I hold the world but it's a stage where every man must play right. a part minus that one. So why does Shakespeare begin the play with this long, inconclusive dialogue about Antonio's melancholy? All it establishes is that Antonio is melancholy, yeah. and it doesn't say why. So one answer that's often given is that it's because he, it, of the love that dare not speak its name. His, his passion for Bassanio, and he has an inkling that Bassanio is in love with Portia. Right. He knows it already, even though we don't. Well, actually, Bassanio he does it. say, he says, um, tell me what that, you, again, you can probably quote the lines better than I can, but the, um, tell me of that lady, you know, because Bassanio's already given, given him a clue. In fact, I would argue there was a line that Shylock says later. He says, Antonio's got this fleet in here, this fleet in there, and he says, other ventures he has squandered abroad. Yeah. Now I decided that meant Bassanio was the other venture he squandered abroad. Oh really? Yeah, because where else is Antonio's money? He gave Bassanio money to woo Portia early when he went the first time, just before Portia's father died. So I had that actor, I was like, you direct this directly to Bassanio. Okay, now you're seeing stuff I didn't I I thought that the first time he knew about uh, Bassanio about Portia was when when Bassanio says, in Belmont is a lady richly left. No, he, he actually has already been to Belmont once. That's when they made oh, the, yeah. the no, eyes, no, right? No, but has he, where, do you, where do you find that Bassanio, that Antonio knew about that before? That's um, the part. We could try to he, Yeah, see if we can find it. I don't think, um, it's, if it's there, I missed it. Let so me yeah. take a look. Yeah. Well, tell me now what lady is the same to whom you swore a secret pilgrimage that you today promised to tell me of. Okay. So, yeah. at some point in the past. Okay, and where's the in Belmont is Lady Bridgley? That's yes. right after. Um, where are we? Uh, he, Bassanio hems and haws for a bit. And yeah, then, okay, you're right, right. So, okay. the question, the way I set up the timeline you're was right. that Bassanio went to Belmont to woo Portia. And he told, and he told him, yeah, I right, Antonio And this is what I think, it. I think Antonio, I decided, I think there's enough evidence to support the fact that Antonio funded trip one. There's a, there's a second reason I'll tell you why I believe that to be so. So that, I, I really love having Shylock hit him with other ventures he has squandered abroad. Because uh -huh. if there's somewhere, Bassanio already admits to being in Antonio's debt. Mm -hmm. And what would he be in debt for? Well, because he's a prodigal. They're, yeah. they're all prodigals. <laughs> That's true. The, the young Venetians throw their money around. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about, I'll jot myself Oh, can I get back to the melancholy? Yeah, that's why I don't want to. See, all, I think the melancholy is he's worried about his ships. Because that's all the reasons that all his friends keep giving. I'd be worried about my ships doing this. I'd be worried about my ships. And I think he is worried about his ships. And I think that the play is an awful lot about the anxieties of an, a burgeoning um, global trade in, right. in that period in England. And the worries about, I mean, the hopes that this global trade will make you fabulously wealthy and the anxieties that it will involve you in with the contamination of contact with inferior foreign countries. And I think that Yeah, you hear Antonio say a little bit about that, you know, trade consists of, of all nations. Right. And, and the actor who's playing that in, in my production, he said he wanted to add a little bit of xenophobia to it. And so he twisted those lines to, to bring that out of him, which I thought was a lot of fun. Yeah, and I think there is xenophobia in the play. On the one hand, the desire for the tremendous wealth that 
foreign trade brings, and on the other hand, the anxiety about the compromising of English identity in that foreign trade. I mean, you can even see a, a similar thing. In a way, the contest for Portia is an international contest, and the yes. two losing suitors are identified by their foreigners. One is called Morocco, one is called Aragon. Bassanio is not called Venice. He's called, he's a human being, he, right. he's one of us. The others are objectified, just like Shylock is always called Jew in the play. Hardly anybody calls him Shylock. Right. And so foreigners... It's an interesting parallel. I, yeah. there are a lot of, there's a lot of xenophobia in the play. And I think that that is um, connected. Well, my goodness, right now, all this worry about trade with China and Latino workers in the United States. Right. I mean, as we get more and more involved in global trade, what's a byproduct? On the one hand, we want all the wealth that comes from it, and on the other hand, we're very afraid of American identity being compromised. Right? Sure. And I, I taught English in China for a while, and they were very much interested in Western trade and things like that, but they didn't want Western culture. So that's why you would see this expansion and contraction of contact with the West, because they wanted their cultural identity, but they wanted to learn from the West. And so it was this, we want openness, we don't want openness. We want openness because we want we want, want the so, money. But yeah, we want the money and we want some of the know-how, but we certainly do not want the cultural things that are not yeah. part of what we, right. we want. And, and English has got to be the national white, right? All this movement, you know? Right. But what I also see in that is that Antonio, no matter how wealthy he gets, is still mercantile class, merchant class. Yeah. That he will never be aristocracy. No, no. So that, Bassani was basically penniless. He has no money, and but he's nobility. He has courtly graces. He probably speaks a gazillion languages. What does he say? He's trained in archery. All of this sort of thing. This is these are things Antonio wouldn't have done. He would have come up. I'm not sure exactly how, but he would have come up as a businessman. That's interesting. You see a class difference between them. Oh, very much. And I think that in a way that someone might want to hang out with Donald Trump because. Ah, oh, look at his wealth. But he might be impressed by someone of a certain social class. It's that odd frisian. I, I saw that as one reason they, they were interested in each other on that level. Uh, one thing I did was. Um, can, can I say something please, about what you were just you saying? Which I thought was interesting. Um, I, I think it's very interesting that Portia comes into the courtroom and says, which is the merchant here and which, which the Jew? Because if Shylock's really wearing a Jewish gabardine, it should be obvious. Yeah, un unnecessary. that's also a big academic question: is why is he? But I, she say? but I think a big part of the project in this play is to make a big sharp distinction. It goes on what you were just saying about Antonio: a big distinction between the merchant, the legitimate English merchant, or you know, he's Venetian, but he's really English, right? Cool. And and the nasty Jewish moneylender. So it's the distinguishing, I think Shylock is there partly to be a scapegoat for the contamination of the money economy. Antonio, as, as you say, is involved in that money economy, but I think the, uh, one of the projects of the, uh, as many uh, people of the new men in Shakespeare's audience were. Right. And, but I think part of the project of the play is to um, launder them, uh, launder right. that money by making Shylock uh, take on all the opprobrium that went with the negative characteristics of a money money grubbing. But, and but, I think but that, that said, at, there's a point, very at, at a central point, that Shylock says money is not important to me, not at all. All he cares about is revenge on Antonio. They can offer him all the money in the world. He's even out three thousand ducats. But he, there is a shift where he says money isn't important. I've lost my daughter. I've lost anything that ever mattered to me. And so I find the mercantile claim on Shylock's motives, or in fact anyone's motives, breaks down. Because he keeps rejecting He, money he wants often. Antonio dead, you're right. Yeah. But then, of course, when they take his money away, he says, you might as well kill me if you take away my money because he would be a beggar on the street. Antonio yeah. says the same thing. Yeah. He says, I am glad Shylock's about to kill me. I've lost everything at sea. I'm 
penniless. Yeah. I want to die. Yeah. And that's... But I, I think a big project with this play is to get that money away from Shylock and put it where it belongs. You know, to trans to, to launder it in a way. The money comes from this dirty trade of usury. Right. And when Portia gets her hands on it and brings it back to Belmont as a gift, it's it's laundered. It's well, no longer the product. Yeah, I, product I also of looked at it. Trade. I looked at it that if if Jessica were truly, if things were the way they should be, and Jessica were not a Jew and she were Christian, her father would give her a dowry and bring it, you know, half his money or whatever it would be, and bring it to Lorenzo. So I saw that as not so much a money laundering, but but the proper order of things is for a daughter to go with a dowry. And here, although Jessica is forced to steal the money, and Portia does these legal tricks to keep her in the inheritance and things like that, it's still making things right in the world. Oh, I think, yeah, I think, I agree with you. I mean, I think, uh, you're, I think that the general push of the play is to make you exculpate all the awful things that are done to Shylock and think, yeah, yeah, things are just as they should be now. That money's where it belongs. Yeah, I think you're, I, although, but then, it's funny, it's a wonderful play because it's so complicated, it's got such loose ends. Right. You were talking about the rings and giving up the rings. There's one guy in this play who values a ring. And that's Shylock. Shylock, yeah. that turquoise ring that Leah gave for a monkey, he wouldn't have given it. He, for anything, yeah. For anything. So, so here's Shylock, supposedly the mercenary evil one, and he values Leah's first gift. When and he was and even more one. importantly, he values bonds. He values oaths. He values contracts yeah. in a way that Antonio and Bassanio, Graziano, these people cannot. And if there's anything that is very clear from the play, it's, it's, it's about bonds. It's about contracts. Um, contracts in um, exchange and contracts of marriage. You don't cheat. You don't, you, you stick to your vows. And Shylock and Portia and Marissa stick to their vows, whereas the men are not able to do that, the other men. Did you know that Shakespeare's father was a money lender? Shakespeare's father? Uh, was it usually? I knew he was a glovier. A glovier. Which I, yeah, but, but he, was, he was also a usurer. That I did not know, because I've looked, but where did you find that? Oh, gosh. Uh, I think I have uh, one of the many places where that's uh, Document in my in one of the books of my office. Should I go get it? Uh, no, no. But I would be very Showed curious. You. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But it's it's now known. So that puts another cast on. And his father whole. was a big alcoholic. So I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't? Oh no. no, he was he was often cited for drunkenness or fined or this or that or the other thing. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. I didn't know that. But I, I, I did know the thing about the usury, yeah, which, which puts an that. interesting line. Of, I had a couple more questions for you. Please, I, I please. Um, I was, uh, you didn't um, interpolate much. The only two things I noticed were the beginning, which was a kind of uh, dumb show of Portia's father's funeral, right. and then a few places where um, Jessica and Shylock speak Hebrew to each other. Or, yes. You know, what? I don't know if it's real Hebrew. But it is. It is definitely real Hebrew. Yeah, but, uh, but it's you know it could. You could well, I guess you couldn't get away with fake Hebrew nowadays. You know the way Shakespeare no, we, gets we, away with well, fake Welsh. Well, what we Welsh. did, uh, we were in Cambridge, and um, and there, you know, there are translations of the Merchant of Venice into Hebrew. I contacted the the scholar who had done some work, got his permission, and then brought it to some people at the synagogue I was going to, and said. Can you transliterate this? That's so great. And then the actors were able to, you know, Cambridge University students, they were able to definitely do it. Handle it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm interested in both of those choices, you know, what you were what you were up to. Um, we have to remember the actors. Uh-huh. The director's best job is to cast the best actors he can find. So in casting that Shylock, which I almost that was a very difficult thing to find someone who could actually great. do it. Yeah, he was he was wonderful, and and I almost didn't have, I almost you know didn't have one. I I auditioned several people. It was down to two, or three, but the one I really wanted decided he couldn't do it, and so the other two I was not happy with. So we reopened auditions, and finally he came aboard, 
and so that was wonderful. Is he the one you wanted from the first? Uh, no, I would have wanted him from the first if I if he had come, but he wasn't planning on doing a production. Uh, he just he was either theoretically busy with classes or what have you. He was lovely. Yeah. So. I think it was his idea. That's basically what I want to say. It was his idea. Wouldn't it be cool if we did some lines? In Hebrew. In Hebrew. Yeah, that's neat. That's a really, so. it's a really good thing. I like it so much better. I've, I've seen some productions where they try to make Shalak more Jewish by using kind of caricature Jewish things, and I think that's right. so inappropriate. This was much nicer. It was, it was interesting. When you, when you hold auditions, you see ways the character could go. Uh, I knew I sort of wanted to do the victim but noble Shylock. Yeah. I, I certainly for my first production of Merchant of Venice I didn't want to do the other one. There was an actor I auditioned who just whatever he said he was villainous. He just yeah. was. That's who the that's who what the what the actor would bring to the role. And then I had another one, the the, the actor who ends up Dan Martin who ends up playing many different roles. He's a comic actor. He's just funny. Whatever he said from Shylock was funny, and, yeah. and you can get a comic Shylock, you can get a villainous Shylock, and it was just, this was the way I wanted it to go. Well, you can also get a kind of sentimental, a noble victim. Uh, the first Shylock I ever saw was Morris Karnofsky, who was a great, tragic actor on the Yiddish stage, and it was very moving, but it was, it completely skewed the play, because it, the play became, not the comedy of The Merchant of Venice, it became the tragedy of Shylock. Right. And that's, I think, that's a common, common trap. And yeah. again, that's something that you taught me, was that this is, this is not, and especially if you look at the numbers, Shylock has, what, a third of the lines of, of Portia, and maybe I, even less. Well, I think he has ha about half of Portia. Uh -huh. Half of even half. less, doesn't he? Oh, you got, yeah, I wrote, I wrote okay. it. I can't oh, no, remember it's, the, it's, it's Antonio that has even, the, you know, he, Antonio the, the has, Merchant of Venice has right. almost no lines. Right, right, compared right. To the others. But yeah, he has half the lines, and the character is just so amazing that he does tend to unbalance production. Yeah, yeah. Well, even in its own time, the play was uh, was entered. I think it was entered in the Stationers' Register as the Jew of Venice. The Jew of Venice, yes. And if you go down the street and you say to people, "Who's the Merchant of Venice?" I say, "Shylock." Yeah, yeah. They don't think it's Antonio. And Antonio is the Merchant of Venice, but right. he's even not. We can talk a little bit more oh, we, about we it. Lost, we lost. Oh, we for, we got away from the homoerotic uh, bit. Right. We started, and then we just. Started I want to tell you what I felt about that. Right. Uh, which was I. I'm a huge fan of source stories. Uh huh. Uh, Shakespeare generally didn't generate his own pro own plots. Right. On almost all of his plays, he went to source stories. So I think it's really helpful to sort of fill in some of the gaps, and it's certainly to get some ideas about okay, what was the raw material Shakespeare was working with. And I found out that Bassanio was one of three brothers, and the father left the estate to the, to the older two. And he did this out of love because he wanted Bassanio to go out and seek his fortune in Venice with his godfather. And the other brothers are so lovely, they say, hey, look, dad didn't leave anything to you. We're happy to redivide this. And he says, no, this is what my father wanted me to do. And so he goes to Venice, and Antonio is his godfather and nurtures and cares for him. And I thought about it, and I said, the bond I have that is stronger than anything else in the world is the bond of my son. There is nothing, no love, no romantic love, that can come close to that bond. And I said, that's what I want you guys to focus on, that this is that kind of bond. It's deeper, greater than any sort of homoerotic relationship. Yeah. Now, that said, whenever we actually got the thing up and running, it was like, there's something under here. There definitely yeah. is something going on under there. But I think if you're directing it properly, you say, let that be subtext. We don't know. We can never know exactly what's going on. And productions I've seen where they try to put a button on it and say, this is a homoerotic relationship. They have a sexual relationship. As soon as you do that, then you localize it, and I actually think you don't create a strong bond between them because you're like, well, you know. Uh, you have a few more questions. Oh, I, yeah, I was interested in the beginning with the. I, I thought it was very effective, and I thought it um, threw your emphasis right where you wanted on Portia's predicament to start with her father's. I, I took that was that. one. Of, yeah, of course, that was the reason to get Portia out there, and so many of Shakespeare's comedies start with this. 
are precipitated by these these deaths. You've got Twelfth Night when there are orphans, and you have yeah. Merchant of Venice. I mean, I probably could name a lot. I don't remember them all, but uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, Hamlet, obviously. Henry the Sixth, Part One, begins with the funeral of Henry the Fifth. Yeah, yeah. I I thought that was nice. I thought really. I just I loved your film. I oh, you know you. I thought you had <laughs> terrific you. actors, and I thought you used them so well. And, Obviously, somebody must have been you directed them well. I don't know, yeah. But it, it was really s stunning. And, you know, as, as I said, I want to show it to my students. Oh, great. I'm sure you've seen a lot of uh, Merchant of Venice productions. I have. I have, both on stage. And I'm trying to think what film I saw. Uh, Did you see the Al Pacino version? Oh, yeah. we got to wait until. Uh, well. You don't want <laughs> How are you guys going on tape? Are we. This says I have uh, 41 minutes. Uh, I got 42. You don't want me on tape saying what I think of that. Oh, no, you do, because I won't say it. I won't use it, but maybe we will. <laughs> no, I, I'd rather. I, did, it, it didn't, I didn't like it. I, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, okay, this is interesting. And I watched it a second time, and I was like, oh, this is the most atrocious thing. Yeah. Especially after I looked at the text. I was like, they didn't get it. They missed, yeah. they missed it. Well, you know, I think one problem with this play, and one reason why Shylock gets overemphasized, is the star. You get a star actor. He gets right. Shylock's role. He cuts around Shylock. Yes. He brings Shylock out. He makes Shylock. It's to make it. It. It um, ruins the weight of the pl play. It ruins the balance of the play because it overemphasizes Shylock. But that's partly about the economics of big time theater because you want to. You know, you you're paying for a star, so you want to feature him. And it's about the egos of the star actors who right. have the right. And nobody also knows how to make the fifth act play. It's not an afterthought. It's the, it's the most important part because Portia is winning Bassanio. Yeah. She has to basically bring him, make him heal, or else she's going to lose him, or else he will go have sexual dalliances in Venice. Men, woman, who cares? He needs to know that this, this is where it's at, and he's not taking off his ring to pretend he's single or, or whatever, and so that, 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 that fifth act is so crucial. Do you, do you notice that she's kind of taking over Shylock's role there? In, in how so? Well, she, he's, Shylock says, I once did give my, lend my body, you know, I pawned right. my body for him, and now I give my soul, my soul upon the forfeit. Oh, Antonio, the, yeah. Yeah. It, so, no, but Portia takes over Shylock's role. Right. Because he gave, he pawned his body to Shylock for Antonio, now he's pawning his soul to Portia for right. Antonio. So she's taking over Shylock's role only worse. I think also one thing people overlook is Antonio's the bad guy. He's the antagonist of the whole piece. And I think he uses Shylock as just one piece of the puzzle to bind Bassanio to him. Why is that bad, though? He, he oh, I don't say it's bad. I just say that's, that's what people overlook. It's, this is, and that's also why the fifth act works, because Antonio only agrees Portia only relents when Antonio steps up and says, I will bind him. I will let him go. And Anto I will Antonio bind says, I'll bind myself. Right? He says, my soul upon the yes. forfeit. And then Portia relents. She says, then you shall be a surety. And she gives him back. She but, says, right. So it's only when, although she's, one thing I felt in staging that scene is, although she's attacking Bassanio, saying, bad boy, bad boy, bad boy, it doesn't actually... Nothing stops until Antonio says. Yeah, but, but she sucks. She, she subjects Antonio to what's theoretically a, a harsher bond than Shylock subjected him to. His soul, right. Yeah. And so that's not too good. No, it's good. It's good. He's, he's, no, <laughs> he's, really? bearing, he's bearing witness to their union. Right? Yeah. And that's, uh, that's what Shakespeare's dealing with here, is, is that commandment that you shall not bear false witness. So when Bassanio swears to keep the ring, and then he breaks that commandment, that fundamental one of the Ten Commandments, that he's bearing false witness, that he's lying, then what you need to do is teach everybody in the play, this is not about lying. This is about holding your bonds, marital bonds. You name the bond. Um, and so Antonio's soul upon the forfeit is actually the right thing to do. Well, she, then she's out shallowing Shylock. She, Shylock's the other, the, the two characters in the play that are very big on it, making people uphold their bonds are right. Shylock and, and Portia. Shylock and Portia. Shylock's fundamental flaw, though, I mm -hmm. think, and uh, 
is he has this bond. He has it. It's a written contract. But there's a higher law that the bond he made was a bond of murder. So the bond itself is corrupt. And when he says, my deeds upon my head, she basically says to him, she says, if you do this, you're going to go to the bad, nasty place. And he says, my deeds upon my head. So he's going to break, what is the commandment not to kill? Is it the third or fourth commandment? He's going to break that commandment and take responsibility for it because he believes his bond that he's made is sort of the higher thing. Of course, she says, no, you've got it backwards. The commandment not to kill, the ability to show mercy is more important than the piece of paper you have. That's even greater than the, what you swore to heaven. Your, your, your bond now is to God not to go through with this, truly. So, I don't know. I, I watched Hamlet recently, and it's the same thing. It's all of these characters who lie. And that seems to be Shakespeare's obsessed with people lying. Well, but in King Lear, Edgar lies all the time, and he's a hero. He's a good yeah. guy. Yeah. He lies to his father to, to save him from despair. That's true. Let's not go there now. Okay. <laughs> we could go on Lear for a while. Yeah. That's my other favorite. Me, me too. Last words? Do we have anything else? I'm trying to think. There's something about Act 5 that I wanted to talk about, and I can't remember. I can talk about something in Act 5. What? It was the same thing I felt about Act 5 as the same as staging the Morocco scene. Uh huh. Is that you don't play it for laughs. The laughs are, if the laughs are going to be there, they'll come. Trust Shakespeare, trust the text. But you have the actors play it honestly. So what has Bassanio done? He's betrayed Portia. It doesn't matter that she set up the whole thing and she knows it and we know it or whatever. And so you can play wink, wink, nudge, nudge to the audience. But the reality is that she tricked him, but he went through with it. So what is her emotional response to having done that? And I think she's, she feels what anyone who would feel if someone had done that. And yeah. so I had I wanted that actress to play that truthfully, and I think she does, and we got laughs. Anyway, yeah. See, I think that uh, the casket test that Bassanio passes with flying colors, mm -hmm. although maybe she's giving him some hints. I know that's like, another thing that I will not. I, again, it's about the honesty of the moment and the scene. That if you play that. Uh -huh. then you lose the dramatic power of the scene. You do know that she knows which casket because by this time the other two are eliminated. So you don't think that the song is a hint? The song is a hint, but it's another, that's, a, that's Shakespeare winking to the audience if they get it. But Bassanio doesn't get it. Okay. But I, 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 don't, I, I just think I, that's a bit of play. I don't think that you could truly say, what is it, bed, head, whatever, it rhymes with lead. I don't think. Reply. Reply, 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 yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Bassanio passes the casket test with flying colors, and that's a test in which there are two wrong answers and one right answer. Mm -hmm. He flunks the ring test. He does flunk but, the ring test, yeah. But I don't think there's a right answer to the ring test. The, uh, if he, you, you've already pointed out all the reasons why the answer he gave is wrong. Right. But the answer he didn't give is also wrong. He failed the ring test when he offered any payment. That's when he failed. In other words, when he said anything you ask for. And he should never have done that. In fact, he failed several times during the courtroom. He said, I would give my wife up. You know, what does he say? He says, I would. I wish you were in heaven. He, one of them says, I wish Rossiano you were in heaven. says, I wish you were in heaven to entreat some yeah. power. Uh, Bassanio says, um, I have a wife. I have a wife, right. So dear to me. And I would sacrifice yeah. all. Yeah. And I think, in the, again, it's about emotional truth he, in the moment. That's what he believes. Well, he's feels. a prodigal. He's a plunger, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. So he's failing. He's failing every step of the way. He's, he's, you know, it's a man. Men in Shakespeare's world are often fickle, and they're often, they're not constant, and they need to be brought into line by the women. Isn't that true in real life, though? <laughs> that maybe that's where we should end. Yeah. That's great. <laughs>